Hi there, I'm Elaine Bennett, and I am an out boss. Hello, out bosses. Rhodes Perry here, and welcome to this week's episode of The Out Entrepreneur, a weekly podcast where I get to interview today's most inspiring LGBTQ bosses crushing it in business. On today's show, I'm excited to welcome Elaine Bennett, who is joining us all the way from Cape Cod. So, Elaine, are you ready to inspire fellow out bosses? I am. Excellent. All right. So, a little bit about Elaine. She is an award winning speechwriter and helps leading corporate executives tell their stories memorably. She also teaches writing and storytelling skills to entrepreneurs and others who want to become thought leaders. A great believer in the benefits of writing every day, Elaine runs writing challenges to help people start their own writing practice, and Elaine walks her talk and currently holds a daily writing streak of 571 consecutive days of writing. Okay, so you're inspiring me already, Elaine. I'm I'm really (laughs) excited to have you on the show. And to kick things off, can you tell us a little bit more about your business and what makes it unique? Sure. I'll just say that what makes it unique is that it's it's me. And that's one of the things that I tell all of my writers. There's not a lot of new things under the sun. So chances are whatever you're writing about, other people have written about it before. But nobody has written about it from your perspective and with your experience and your lenses And so you should never worry about writing something that's already been written. Unless you start with platitudes and cliches, everything you say is going to be is going to be from you. So that's what makes my business unique is that it's my business. But what I do is I write speeches and other things for high level corporate executives. And I've been doing that for 25 years. I don't count any higher than 25. So let's just say 25 years. And in the last couple of years, it occurred to me that there are lots of people in the business world and also entrepreneurs who need to write for their business and don't have the institutional support and the budget that the big CEOs have to hire somebody like me. So I've started a business to help people learn how to do it yourself and write with the same quality of writing that the corporate CEOs have. I think that's incredible. And I like that you've scaled your business out to not only serve those that have pretty deep pockets, but creating a structure where you're also helping smaller business owners find their voice. And similar to to writing in business, oftentimes we're providing services that other people are providing. And like you said, it's really finding that unique value add that you bring so that people want to do business with you because they like, know, and trust you. So you're working with CEOs. There are many of them out there. There's even more small businesses out there. Right now in your business, how's you most inspired? What are you doing today that might be a little bit different than when you first got started? I love working with this new population of emerging leaders and entrepreneurs. It's so exciting to me to see them grow in the course of a program or to see them discover something as I'm coaching them one-on-one. It's so energizing to me. I never would have expected it. Yeah. I mean, this this day and age, the barriers to entry to starting your own business is, is a little easier, although it's pretty pretty difficult. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And at the same time, there's new and exciting ways to work with smaller business owners. And again, you know, I love what you're doing. I like asking people the motivation that got you started from the beginning. So you, you had said that you initially were a speechwriter. And when you were thinking about breaking out on your own, what was that motivation for starting your business? Did you feel a passion to do it? Or was it out of necessity? You know, what was that motivating factor for you? Well, I'm going to break this into two parts because really today I am an entrepreneur, but I would not call myself an entrepreneur 25 years ago when I started my business. I was self-employed back then. And the difference, you probably understand the difference between being an entrepreneur and being self-employed is when I was self-employed, I took my cues from the market and people would send me work. I would do it. I would obviously go out and pitch some work now and then, but really it was a very outward into me directed thing with my entrepreneurial, when I discovered my entrepreneurial drive. I have been supremely proactive over the last two years to the point where I've been working much too hard. And I'm now 
my goal for this quarter is to find at least 20 hours a week when I'm not working. And of course, I'm not counting my sleeping time in that, but 20 hours a week of just having fun because I have cut that out of my life and that's not acceptable. But so as an entrepreneur, I'm much more proactive. I started blogging every day. I started writing every day. I started working with my clients. So what was your question? (laughs) <laughs> oh, the, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. I love what you were saying, uh, just in terms of making that distinction between being self-employed versus being an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, the, the initial question was really, what was that motivation to get you started? So even when you first got started as someone who was self-employed, you know, I'm assuming you were working for someone prior to yeah, that. Yeah, what was that I, break for you? I was the speechwriter for the CEO at Solomon Brothers. And I'll back up and tell you how that happened. I was the CEO speechwriter, and then Solomon Brothers went through a crisis where somebody did something illegal, and they almost went out of business. And what kept us from going out of business was our largest shareholder stepped in, and he said, I will be the interim CEO. And the SEC said, the Securities Exchange Commission said, okay, if you're going to be the interim CEO, then Solomon can stay in business. And so... That was how I found myself writing for Warren Buffett. Hmm. And what happened was they had a big press conference on a Sunday to announce that Warren was coming in and I was sitting in the back of the room taking notes and somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, we need you to go back to your office and write something. So I did. And the thing they wanted me to write was a letter that was going to go out to all of Solomon's clients and it was going to be signed by Warren. And so I wrote this thing and this is back in the early 90s before email was in great use in in the company. And I didn't know who was going to be reviewing this letter because everybody above my immediate boss had basically been fired. So for some reason, I decided I was going to write my name on the top of the page and my office phone number. And so I did. I sent it out in the world. And the next day, my phone rings. Lane, this is Warren Buffett. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. (laughs) So Record says, scratch. Yeah. yeah. So then he says, did you write this thing? And I said, well, y- y- yes, sir, I did. And he said, it sounds like I wrote it. Wow. And I said, well, sir, that's that's my job. And so that was the beginning of a really super working relationship that was just a great blessing in my life. I can only describe it that way. And so after Warren left the company, after things were stabilized, Really, the new CEO wasn't really so much into a speechwriter, and so I found some greener pastures for myself, and I went out on my own. Wow. That is a tremendous origin story for your business, right? Especially, there's a big transition in this big corporation where you're working at, and there wasn't as much oversight as probably normal in a big corporation. And you had this opportunity to put your name on top of the page and you get a call from Warren Buffett. And the next thing you know, you're, you're in business because people are seeing your unique talent. You had mentioned that a new CEO came in and I'm wondering with the culture at Solomon Brothers, did you ever feel like you didn't fit in because of your LGBT identity? If you could talk a little bit about that workplace culture. So this was the early 90s. I guess I started there in 89. And nobody was really so out. I mean, it's not like today. I interviewed with a client I've been working with for the last 11 years. And when I had one interview with them, I think it was my first or second, I mentioned that I'd done some work for an LGBT nonprofit. And I I named the nonprofit. And woman interviewing me after the end of the interview, she came scurrying out to the elevator bank to find me. And she said, you know, we give a lot of money to the human rights campaign. And (laughs) I said, well, that's lovely. Thank you for telling me. (laughs) And that was her way of saying, yeah, we know, we know you're, you're out and and that's really cool by us. So it wasn't like that back at Solomon in the late eighties and the early nineties is a very macho, environment. And as a matter of fact, I had a saying that I made up, which is that women on Wall Street either get laid or get laid off. Mm. So in that paradigm, let me just say that I got laid off. But Mm. I was in a relationship and it turned out to be a 10 year long relationship. But I had a picture of my partner on my desk. It was mostly a picture of my cat in the garden. But (laughs) in 
in the last third of the picture, it was my partner's head and part of her torso as she was stretched out on her chaise lounge in the garden. So it was that kind of outness. Right. And they had an, an African-American executive who came to me and he was giving a speech and he was going to speak at something before Bill Clinton's first inauguration. And they were having some sort of high level job fair of people who were qualified to work for the administration. And he was he was going to introduce this thing. And it was a job fair for, I think, African-Americans or maybe just people of color. I'm not sure. And so he gives me this thing that he's written, and I've got like 20 minutes before he gets in the car to go to the airport. And so there wasn't a whole lot I could do with it, but I saw that he had written, and we something like, we hope that you will consider diverse hires. And I crossed it. I was like, no, 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 no. We are way past the time of hoping. We expect that you will consider diverse hires. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me, this little white girl sitting at the desk, and he's like, how did you know that? Mm. (laughs) And I thought about coming out to him then, but I didn't. I ran into him years later at a Christmas party my mentor had, and he was there with his wife and I was there with my partner. And so I introduced my partner to him and he said, oh, how long have you two been working together? And I'm like, no, 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 she's my partner. Like, And his wife slapped him on the shoulder and said, I knew that. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, nice. I mean, you've shared a lot just in your response. You were talking about Solomon Brothers having this macho culture, being pretty sexist in in your phrase of of being late or being laid off. All of that lived experience, the good, the bad, the ugly, in your everyday business today and thinking about workplace culture, what's one thing that you do to make sure that you're creating a more inclusive environment for those that you do work with, especially for folks who feel excluded? Sure, sure, sure. So one of the things I write a lot about diversity for my clients. And so I'm always on the lookout for ways. And even when I'm not writing about diversity, I'm always on the lookout for ways to drop in more inclusive language. And my clients are very supportive of that. So instead of talking about gender now, I generally talk about gender identity. Oh, so about 10 years ago, I was writing for a CEO and he was speaking at an event with college kids that they sort of wanted to introduce to the company to hopefully that they would either join the industry or they would join the company when they graduated. And I I had him say something like, as a straight white man, and apparently the room just started buzzing. He said he was straight. He said he was straight. Mm. I mean, not that obviously he's straight, but that he mentioned it as a differentiator or as a quality that people would consider so that it's not just accepted that everybody here is straight. No, Mm -hmm. I'm straight. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of perspective I bring in. (laughs) You know, it's hard when you, when you have virtual meetings. So I have a lot of, a lot of conference calls because my clients like to work virtually, which is great because it means I can work with them easily. But so I was on a call once with a bunch of people, some of whom I didn't know, and we were talking about some diversity messaging. And I just stopped for a minute. I said, you know, I don't know George, we've never met, but is everybody on this call white? Yes. Mm-hmm. And there was like this stunned silence. And the person I was working with was like, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Maybe you want to rethink that for the next call. Yeah. Yeah. And just to be that person to raise that, right? And just to kind of like call out the pink elephant in the room. I love what you're saying about these kind of small changes that you make in your writing. You had mentioned you talk about gender identity instead of gender. In a speech, you helped a CEO talk about himself being straight and white to distinguish who he is and acknowledging his privilege, right? And I think that's huge just on the topic of gender identity. My listeners know that I'm transgender, and I think that that's so huge. Like, words really matter. When I hear leaders talk about being straight, white, cisgender, and that they know what that term means, cisgender, I'm like, oh, my God. You know, it really is a a change, and and it's a signal to people 
like me or folks in the rainbow community where it's like, at least there's been some training or coaching where this leader gets why that's important and why it's important for them to own their, their own identity, their own diversity story. So I, I just thank you for doing that. I think that's Absolutely. really incredible. I do want to shift now because the show is called The Out Entrepreneur, and I want to talk more about what brings you to the Rainbow family, um, <laughs> but but specifically as it relates Shoot, to- Butch what, women bring me yeah. to the Rainbow <laughs> family. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I can make some connections to other guests after no, this. No, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. All right. But specifically being out in your own work, I like to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and then focus a lot on the power of what we bring to the business world. And so first, if you can take us back and, and try to maybe- in, in your first couple of years as self-employed pre-entrepreneur, was there ever a time where you were really challenged with disclosing who you were, being your authentic self, being out because you were afraid of maybe losing business or that lucrative client or CEO that you really wanted to work with? And if you can think of a specific example, a story, that's really going to give a lot of confidence to those folks who listen to the show, they're thinking about getting started in their own business, and they're not quite sure how out they can be in their business, especially for folks in less friendly places than mm-hmm. you know, the Northeast or, or yeah. out in where yeah. I live. Yeah. yeah. That's a really excellent question. And I'm not sure how to answer it. Sometimes I have wondered over the past 25 years whether my initial entry into self-employment, say the first five or so years that I was self-employed, whether that was really me hiding a little Mm. from the corporate world and not wanting to go into that world as who I am, because I am out and I have been out among people who know me since forever and with my clients since I left Solomon Brothers when it was warranted. I mean, I spent a lot of time writing about just business and it doesn't matter who you sleep with if you're writing an annual report, you know, except that you bring your own perspective to it. And when there's an opportunity to talk about different kinds of people, you make sure that you you include them. Have I ever worried about losing work? I came out to a woman at my longtime client So she was in the ethics area, and I I write about ethics, too. I love writing about ethics. And I had gone to an event, a diversity event that the client had, and I was talking to some of the LGBT folks. And when I introduced myself at the event, I said, I'm the CEO speechwriter, and if I were a full-time employee, I would be joining the LGBT group. And everybody cheered, and they were really happy to know that the CEO had a lesbian speechwriter. So I was talking to them and they said, we send out emails about events that we're having. And in some offices in really conservative communities, we've gotten emails back saying, I don't want to hear about this. You people are sinners and, you know, that kind of garbage. Mm -hmm. And so I mentioned this to the ethics lady and somehow she got the wrong idea she got the idea that I was saying that the conservative people were right. And I was like, no, 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 no. (laughs) Yeah, I'm a lesbian. I'm good with this. And so I was pleased to see that they used that as an example of what not to do. Right. And I think it's great you're talking about, for the most part, you haven't experienced early on as a self-employed and now in kind of true entrepreneur fashion, working with people that they may learn after the fact that you're a lesbian speechwriter and they're they're cool with it. That's part of what we talk about on the show is oftentimes when you do break out, you're attracting the clients that you want to work with and the clients that really respect, trust, and like you. So I think that that's huge. I liked what you said, though, that early on you were laid off and you became self-employed this idea that you might have been hiding a bit from corporate world of going back, was that because you found freedom and and just kind of, whoa, I don't feel this pressure to have to conform or maybe cover aspects of my sexual orientation because I'm, I get to work with people like Warren Buffett who like me and right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that it was a hundred percent about my sexual orientation. I think maybe it was 60% about that and just 40% about general insecurities that I had about myself fitting into groups and things. I'm better about that now. 
And also, you know, it was a it was a difficult environment to be a woman on Wall Street in the early 90s. I'm not sure that it's much better now. So the fact that I wasn't so eager to leap back into that and then I had opportunities present themselves in the form of retainer clients, that meant that I didn't need to jump back in. So why do that? Right, right. So on the empowerment side now, yeah. <laughs> I would like to amplify the benefits of being an out boss, you know, having yeah. that freedom. And I'd like for you to reflect on why being an out boss from your own perspective is an asset to the work that you do. So you talked about some of the lived experiences that you bring to your writing. Mm -hmm. What are some of those superpowers just from being a part of the Rainbow family that you think are invaluable to the world of business that really allow you to stand out? Well, let me just preface this by saying I am a cis woman and I am a white woman, so I carry a fair amount of privilege with me. But I think that in, if you have not been a member of an oppressed community or a marginalized community, you don't understand what it's like. And I'm also a femme, so I'm not somebody you would look at and say, oh, look at the big dyke. So again, privilege. But I do understand what it's like to feel that I can't bring my whole self to a conversation. And I do know what it's like to worry about what's going to happen when I walk into a room more in the past than now. So I think that that's exactly why I was able to take a look at that African-American speech and say, we don't hope that you'll hire diverse people. We expect that you'll hire diverse people. And to me, I understand why we need a whole bunch of perspectives represented where a, you know, a straight white cis person might not. Right. Right. And I like that you acknowledge that you you have privilege in certain areas and other areas that you don't, and that allows you to relate to other folks who have to cover certain aspects of themselves because of job security concerns. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I oh, really I just I just thought of a story for you. So I got a new client a couple of years ago, and she took me out for a lovely dinner in New York City. It was really excellent. And so we're we're eating and we're talking, and she was asking me questions about me because I had had my first conversation with her, I had to write something. And so I needed to ask her a bunch of personal questions. And she's like, whoa. <laughs> but anyway, so we're, we're eating and she saw that there was a wedding ring on my finger, because at that time, there was a wedding ring on my finger. And she said, so what does your husband do? Mm, yes. And I said, well, my wife does. I didn't make a big deal out of it. It was just I, I said the right word. Yep. So that's, that's the way I deal with it now. Yeah, that's come up a number of times on interviews for the show is that those subtle corrections that yeah. just kind of really gently redirecting people. And in that it allows for all of us, you know, we make assumptions all the time, right? We're humans and yep. people are just like, oh, right. You know, <laughs> that, right. that, yeah, that LGBT people exist and people for, are in same sex relationships and that's, that's cool, right? Hopefully that's for, the reaction. For, for most of our history, most of our lives, if you see a woman with a wedding band on her wedding finger, you can assume that she's got a husband and sure. it's only recently that that assumption is, is incorrect. So sure. uh, it can be incorrect. Yeah. And we're seeing that now greater awareness around assumptions around pronouns and we're programmed yeah. to think of life as as binary in a binary context of men and women and so those assumptions definitely can can get people into trouble and yeah uh, the gentle redirection hopefully gets people to recognize like oh i made an assumption here let me correct and move forward without making a big deal about it so it's that's that's really interesting i'm glad that you brought that to this interview let me say something about pronouns because it's a challenge if you haven't been intentional about using pronouns before it's it's a challenge to do it but it's a skill you can learn mm -hmm. and it's it's an adaptation that you can make and it's important to make the adaptation because it's important to be respectful of who people are and you don't know who people are if you're talking yeah. to an audience you don't know who is out there or even if you're just talking to a person, you don't necessarily know. I have a video that I did. Um, it's up on my website that I did for World Speech Day a couple of years ago. And it's a, it's a bit video about pronouns and about the adjustments that we need to make. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and she it was back when Caitlyn Jenner had first come out. And my friend said, well, you know, I'm going to continue to call 
Caitlyn Jenner her children's father because that's the biological role that she played. And there's just not another word for it. And I said, um, parent? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> sure. That's an easy fix and it's gender an inclusive. Easy, it's an easy fix. And people get so siloed into the binary that that is hard for them to, you know, I have a friend who's a transgender person and I was doing some journaling and I was writing about this person and using the pronoun them and they. And the next day I looked over what I'd written and I was like, they, who the hell is they? <laughs> Yes, I had written it and I couldn't even remember. So it's an adjustment, but it's an yes. adjustment that we need to learn to make because the world is full of lots of people now and not everybody looks or sounds or feels or identifies the way you do. Right. Yeah. With Facebook, they and I think that this is further expanded. 50 different genders were identified on Facebook. So it's probably good to get into the practice of not making assumptions around gender. But I really love what you're saying about pronouns. And I do a lot of work with, with businesses around being more gender inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm just going to take a clip from this interview and play it to be like, here's someone who's cisgender and they get this. So mm -hmm. I thank you for creating the, the video that you created. A, a, I definitely will include that in the show notes for the audience who's tuning in right now. Considering some of the challenges that we talked about, the assumptions that people make about us in business and, and all of our superpowers that we bring, what do you want our listeners to take away to inspire them to be more authentic in their work? Oh, wow. Um, it's really easy to see who other people are. If you look at your friends, you can see exactly what makes each one of them amazing. Mm. People looking at you see the same thing. So if you have trouble figuring out what you bring to the table that somebody else doesn't, talk to somebody who knows you. Mm. And the standard exercises ask people for three adjectives to describe yourself. But you can have a conversation also. There's an exercise that I use called the dinner party exercise. And I'll give you a link to that also. It, it's a little chart you can fill out. And then I have a little video at the end that explains the meaning of the exercise. So I will make a note to get you that. So, so tell me a little bit about the dinner party exercise. Is so that you go through a bunch of scenarios, like somebody from history that you'd want to have dinner with, somebody from your field of business that you'd want to have dinner with, somebody from a movie, whether it's an actor or a character that you'd want to have dinner with. And you go through the chart and you fill that out. And then you fill out for each person, what are the qualities that that person has that make you want to have dinner with them? Mm. And then... Yeah. That's so very cool. It shows you the kinds of people you want to hang out with. And then I can't tell you the rest because if I told <laughs> you the rest, the exercise wouldn't work. Got it. Well, you you have definitely piqued my interest. I hope other listeners are interested as well. So I'm looking forward to that link and we'll include that in the show notes too. So one additional question just on the business side. It's clear that you are an obvious champion of LGBT inclusion and some of the examples that you gave in your business or just kind of in life in general, what are some ways that you're giving back to LGBT communities, whether that's through mentoring younger talent or charitable giving? What's one way that you're bringing some meaning and value to help us on that pathway to having a more level playing field? Yeah, I am really interested in supporting LGBT youth and so there's an organization called the Point Foundation that mm, gives yeah. scholarships to LGBT kids. And I've done some writing, it was a while ago, I did some writing for another foundation like that or a nonprofit like that that did scholarships for LGBT kids. And I actually got to work with the kids briefly who were preparing speeches to give at the gala, thanking people for giving money to the organization so that they could go off to college. And that was, that was really lovely being able to work with those kids. And I should be doing more. Oh, no, I think the Point Foundation is fantastic in really supporting that next generation, some of whom will be the next out business owners. I, you know, I think that's incredible. You know, the next generation is so exciting because they're a generation that will, for the most part, 
they will grow up just being themselves, you know? I had a conversation, I met I met a woman recently, and I said, so tell me your coming out story. And she said, you know, I will tell you my coming out story, but in 10 or 20 years, kids won't have coming out stories to tell because they will just be. And that's such a lovely vision. Yes. It's a vision that we're definitely working towards. And yeah. I think for successful people like yourself, you're providing these really positive possibility models for young people where 30 or 40 years ago, that was a lot harder to find, right? Oh, impossible. Um, right, right. So I'd like to shift just a bit and go into business mindset. Okay. Um, so, and I, I want to hone in on this concept of the imposter complex, mm. and which comes from this idea of unconscious yeah. limiting beliefs. Yeah. And this is newer for my audience. You know, I kind of ask these standard questions. And so I've added these. So just like unlimiting beliefs, they show up for us in the Rainbow Family, maybe because of some of the pervasive bias or discrimination that some of us endure. And some of the limiting beliefs are this, these thoughts of like, we're not good enough, smart enough, or worth personal yeah, yeah, career, yeah, financial yeah. success. Got it. Yeah. So for you, when you first got started in your business, how did you overcome the feelings of you're not ready? You know, you're, you're getting a call from Warren Buffett, right? You're like, oh my gosh, like, I'm not ready. Or did you, did you experience that or feelings of not being good enough, like initially when you were first getting started? Well, yeah. So, so let me first say that Everybody has limiting beliefs, even right. that very successful, straight, white, cisgender dude sitting at the top of the meeting table. He has limiting beliefs, too. Mm -hmm. So if you have limiting beliefs, and I still have limiting beliefs, Rose, this is not something that I got over. I think you get over one set of limiting beliefs and another one steps up and says, hi, you're ready <laughs> for me now. But one thing I was told one advice I piece of advice I was given when I was still in college was if somebody asks you to do something if you know how to do something and you've never done it before just say yes because you're smart enough to figure out how to do it you can go buy a book or these days you could google it right, right. so when I was at Solomon Brothers. I was actually working as a temp in the corporate communications department, and they kept trying to hire me permanently, and I kept saying, why would I want to do that? You're Solomon Brothers. I mean, I was a theater major in school. So one day they came to me and they said, well, our CEO is going to go out and do some public speaking, and he needs a speechwriter. Do you know how to write a speech? Mm -hmm. I had never written a speech in my life, but I did take one semester of playwriting in college. So I said, sure, I know how to write a speech. Nice. And that was how I became the speechwriter for the CEO of Solomon Brothers. And that enabled me to do everything that I've done since then. So do your best to ignore your limiting beliefs or just to Tell your limiting beliefs to sit in a corner while you do the work that you need to do. Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic, mm -hmm. is about fear and creativity, and it is one of my Bibles. And she talks a lot about how she has conversations with her fear and says, look, I'm going to go write a book now. And I know you want to come along for the ride, but I just want you to know you can sit in the back seat, but you can't play with the radio. And you need to leave me alone because I'm writing this book. And that's a really great model for dealing with fear. You can also draw, I have drawn a picture of my fear monster. Hmm. And it's called Marproc for marketing procrastination, because that's the thing that I mostly have fear around. And it's just something you, as long as you breathe, there's going to be some area in which you feel like you're not good enough or somebody else is better than you. And it's just part of life and you need to learn to deal with it. But don't let your LGBT status, don't give that any more weight than any other thing because everybody goes through this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I liked what you were saying about saying yes to, to opportunities, even when you may feel like you don't have the skills to do them. And But, but you did. When you were asked to write that speech, you recalled a time where 
oh wait, I, I did this thing as a theater major, so I see how that translates into doing this now. I think some people have strong opinions, I would say, around this concept of fake it until you make it. Mm. And so I'm curious, what's your take on that? Do you think there's some legitimacy to that concept? Or I think in the example that you gave, you weren't necessarily faking it, you were just transferring skills. So what comes yeah. to mind with that phrase? I think if you're thinking fake it until you make it, then you're focused on the faking it. And if you're doing something, you're not faking it. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't advise this if you're a neurosurgeon, but if somebody says, can you bake a cake? You look at the recipe book or you go to the store and buy a Betty Crocker mix and you bake a cake. Mm -hmm. You're not faking baking a cake. You're actually doing it. You might not be doing it as well as the folks down at the Magnolia Bakery, <laughs> but, but you're making a cake. So acknowledge the skills and the talents that you have and just fake it until you make it, until you make it. Mm -hmm. is a yeah. very subjective thing. So do whatever you're doing to the best of your ability, and then the next time, do it a little better. Yes. I think it's just that taking action piece is real, right? And yeah, that's, yeah, there's yeah. reality to that. So there's yep. no, nothing fake about it. I, I like that. I believe that it definitely takes a village to raise a business because hmm. I feel like businesses are like babies, right? Part of building a village is asking for help. And so I'm curious for you, What's your approach to asking for help in your business when you feel like you're stuck? I am so bad at asking for help, mm. but I'm learning. I'm trying to work on that. I just hired a VA today. Well, yes. I mean, congratulations. Yes. I just started working with her today. So I have coached with a couple of different people and that over the last couple of years, and that's been really, really good for me. It's, it's always good to be able to get somebody else's perspective on your stuff. So I've learned a lot from, they're very different people, but I've learned a lot from each of them. And I think don't be afraid to ask for help. Nobody's going to think badly of you if you say, I'm not quite sure how to do this, or can you think of a better way to do this, or how have you done this? Yeah. Especially yeah. today, people are so primed to be mentors or to be support people that I certainly wouldn't think badly of anybody who said, how do I do this? I'm going to do this thing that you're doing. What's the best way for me to start? Yeah. I think feelings of shame can sometimes pop up. I've definitely been there myself. And my partner always reminds me, she's like, Rhodes, people love to be asked for help. They love connecting other people. I'm like, oh, right. Because I yes. love doing that, right? Yes. So I'm yes. like, okay. But I'm so used to being the connector that sometimes that that pops up for me. So I'm right. glad you, you shared that that you struggle with that as well. And you, you mentioned coaching. And so I, this was my last question on mindset. I just, I wanted your take on for business mentors, coaches, or accountability groups like masterminds. What's your take on that? I'm in a couple of masterminds. I just started with one last week that is put together by Elevate, which is the network for women in business. And I'm in a mastermind group of people who were in a program led by Dory Clark that I participated I in. Yes. Yeah, she's she's great. So she's she's one of the coaches that I worked with last year. I was in the pilot program of her recognized expert class. So if you can find really smart people who understand your business, absolutely mastermind the heck out of them, especially if you're like me. And most days, the only time I get out of the house is to walk the dog. It's really important to have a virtual network outside your walls. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's really key. And I love that you mentioned Elevate and Dory Clark. We had her on the show a couple of episodes back and just really incredible. So, yeah. um, so definitely <laughs> reach out to people who are maybe a little bit further along the path than you or are good at making connections or in your, your field and pick their brains and people want you to succeed. Yeah. So, yeah. I really like that. Thank you for sharing. Aspiring out bosses. Are you struggling with taking that first entrepreneurial leap? Does the imposter syndrome prevent you from getting started? Have you considered seeking support, but you're just not sure where to turn? Look no further. The Out Entrepreneur now offers a coaching and mentorship program where you can access support and strategies to shift your mindset from employee to entrepreneur. 
If you're looking for accountability and a mentor who successfully busted out of the nine to five lifestyle, let's schedule a time to talk today. Visit www.outentrepreneur.com and look for show notes from today's episode to schedule a call. Again, the URL is www.outentrepreneur.com. Together, let's welcome you to the wonderful world of being an out boss. We're now going into our bonus round where we'll have the chance to get to know Elaine just a little bit better, gain some insights on how we can bring our whole selves to work, and then learn one way that we can stay in touch with Elaine after the interview. Okay, Elaine, so are you ready to get some quick fire questions going? No. (laughs) (laughs) This is the hardest part. This is the hardest hardest part. part. Okay, shoot. And don't worry, if you have more to say, it's, it's okay. So here's, this is probably the one hard question. So in one sentence, what does it mean to bring your whole self to work? For me, it means remembering that I am spectacular and anybody who has a problem can just deal with that. I love that. I am spectacular. It's just, that, that could be our mantra, right? Um, yep. Just leads to the next question. So do you have a mantra or a quote that you reference that helps you stay motivated in your business, especially when it gets tough? Do I have a mantra or a quote? Well, <laughs> one of my coaches last year sent me a message and I printed it out and put it up on my wall next to my desk. And she says, Elaine, dear, it's time you recognized a hard truth. You are really good at what you do. <laughs> so that's nice. what I reference when I need a little virtual kick in the pants. Yeah, I love that. Was was that hard to receive for you or were you like, yeah, you're right? No, it made me laugh. So <laughs> nice. it's time you recognize a hard truth. That's a little bit scary way to start something. Oh my exactly. God, you're like, what are you going to say? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that, yeah, that's, that's great. And it's a, it's a good reminder and you, you were able to take that in, right? Okay. So can you share one personal habit that helps you master yourself in your business? Yes. List making and keeping my schedule current. So I've been making lists, to-do lists daily for, oh, probably over a year now. And I've just started using the best self journal, which is a quarterly journal. And it has room for your schedule and your lists and space to write gratitudes and goals all in one journal. So I had been using about three different notebooks for all of those things. And keeping track of my time has been the single best thing that I've done to switch myself from self-employed mode to entrepreneur mode. And so I have a goal of how many hours a week I want to work. And I have, as I said earlier, a goal of how many hours a week I want to not work. So I'm keeping track of that all there. Yeah. And you had mentioned earlier in the interview, 20 hours of fun. That's your commitment every week. Yeah. That might seem really low to some people, but I had been at like zero to five. So it's a big bump up for me, but I think I'm, I'm getting there. I've, I've done it once since October and come close most other weeks. Nice. And this is somewhat related to the list. So maybe you, you put tasks on the list. And so I'm curious, what's one thing that you readily delegate in your business to stay focused on what you're good at? Well, you know, as I said, I just hired a VA. Yes. So <laughs> I'm having one of the things that I've asked her to do is take all the videos of my writing classes and upload them to Vimeo and put them on my website so that people can look at the archives. It's a simple task, but there's five different steps. And it's just maddening to me when I have so many courses that I'm teaching. So I'm very excited that she's going to be taking that over. Yes. Congratulations on that. That's, that's a big step. Thank you. I was talking to a friend of mine today and I said, I just hired a VA and she said, what's that? And I said, it's a virtual assistant. And she said, but the person is real, right? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for now yeah, <laughs> give it 20 a, years and yeah real artificial person. intelligence yeah my assistant yes that's awesome <laughs> that's very funny artificial intelligence and holograms maybe that will be the future of our our business assistant. yeah yeah um uh, okay so this is a question i've been asking and you can you can pass on it if you don't want to go there but i i am curious considering this current presidential administration yeah. and yeah, <laughs> this thinking about our businesses do you believe that 
Uh, number 45, as I call him, is good for LGBT businesses or does harm? I think that number 45 is pretty much bad for every business except for perhaps hedge funds and real estate businesses. And I think that Pence is the scariest thing to happen to LGBT people probably since the 1940s. Mm. So it's interesting because I just got certified a year or so ago. I got certified as a with the NGLCC. Yeah. So I'm I'm a professional lesbian now. And, you know, I worry that it is a fairly bad time to identify myself as a lesbian-owned business. But, you know, what can you do? I am a lesbian-owned business. Yeah, yeah. And are you finding more in your area LGBT businesses kind of coming together and supporting each other more, just given the, the climate that we're in? Yeah, there's actually not a chapter of the NGLCC in Massachusetts. So the closest one is Connecticut, which was the chapter that I had joined when I was living in Connecticut, For strangely enough. And I'm sure there's a ton of gay businesses on the Cape, but I don't live in Provincetown, sadly. I just moved here this fall, so I'm I'm still working on networking. Yeah, yeah. So two more questions, actually. And this one is really thinking about that next generation. We talked about your work Mm -hmm. with the Point Foundation. What would be one piece of advice for you to inspire those folks, the next generation about bosses, to take that first step towards being entrepreneurs? There's good fear and there's bad fear, right? So if you're looking at doing something and it feels horrible to you it feels like no this is really stupid i can't do this then pay attention to that but if you're looking at doing something and the fear is the fear that you get when you're on a growing edge then you got to look at that and say okay maybe I, i i take a deep breath and i'll take one step towards it and see the ground hasn't given way okay let me take another step there's always fear At some point, we talked a lot about that. I've been thinking a lot about fear recently. There's always fear. You just need to learn to deal with it and don't let it stop you because the world needs what you have to give. 100%. And I'm just thinking of that, the the book that you had mentioned, Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic. And with fear comes creativity, right? I mean, sometimes you're, you're pressed for, you know, if you're, thinking about the next place where you're bringing revenue into your business and you have to get creative around that sometimes, you know, that that's a good thing. That's not always necessarily a bad thing. And fear can be a good motivator and it's there. We just have to acknowledge it and not pretend like it doesn't exist. So I think that's great advice. So thank you for that. Sure. So Elaine, thank you so much for your time and, and for inspiring fellow out bosses. Before we go, can you share one way that we can stay in touch with you and learn more about your business? Sure. I am on Twitter at Biz Speechwriter, B-I-Z Speechwriter. And I'm at my website at Bennett Inc., B-E-N-N-E-T-T-I-N-K dot com. And there's a contact me form on the website. And if you contact me, And either on Twitter or on the website and tell me that you listen to the out entrepreneur, give me your email address. I will email you an ebook that I've written that is actually about courageous communication. It's called do it anyway. Yes. I love it. I love it. Thank you for that, that generous gift and and for out bosses who are tuning in, definitely take advantage of that. Give it a close read. It's very relevant for everything that we do every day in our businesses. So I really appreciate that, Elaine. And for out bosses, thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. It's always my privilege to connect with you and so many inspiring out bosses like Elaine. So for details from today's conversation, definitely check out those show notes at www.outentrepreneur.com. And as a next step, subscribe to the podcast, consider leaving a rating and review in iTunes, and be sure to share the show with a friend or a loved one. And for now, keep being your authentic selves 100% of the time. <laughs>